It's a new year and you might be thinking about setting some financial New Year's resolutions. But you might be wondering, what should I do? What do I need to do to improve my finances? And that is exactly what we're going to cover in today's YouTube video as we unveil a brand new tool that's going to help everybody to work out their financial health and get a score and what they need to work on based on that. Let's get into the episode. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year. Good to be back on YouTube. And we are unveiling something really exciting today, uh, which is a fin Medics Money financial score. You take three minutes to answer some questions and it gives you a rating of how your finances are doing and also what you can do to improve them. And the hope is that we will help you to set a financial New Year's resolution. So I think we should just get straight into it. So to access this awesome new tool, you go to medicsmoney.co.uk and you'll land on our amazing homepage. You scroll down a bit and you will see your financial score. You click the button and it takes you to this tab and then you start answering 16 questions. That's it. Now the questions basically are broken down into a few categories and these categories are all that you need to do to increase your wealth. So you need to spend less than you earn and we're going to show you why you really need to do that. Then with that increased savings that you have, you can pay down bad debt like high interest rate credit cards, for example. Once you've done that, you can start investing that surplus money, which all comes from controlling your spending. Then you need to think about protecting your most valuable asset. That is you by getting some protection, getting a will and think about investing and make sure your pension's OK. That is it. It's really simple. But to help you work out where to get started, the score will do that. So shall we get into the categories, go through it, and we'll tell you our score as well at the end. So first slide is all about saving. And you might be thinking, oh, budgets are boring. Uh, I agree. You don't need a budget. You just need to control your spending and use something called Pay Yourself First, which will send you details of when you complete the survey if you need it. But let's start with a quote from Warren Buffett, which is, do not save what is left after spending. Instead, spend what is left after saving. If you do that, you are 90% of the way there, but it's hard to do. Mm. And you're thinking, hold on, I'm a doctor. I don't need a budget. It's no problem to buy coffee every day. This example is now pretty famous. People talk to me about this when I'm wandering around St. George's Hospital. And that is, could you be spending £139,000 on lunch at the hospital? So if you're not on YouTube, we're looking at a graph which shows that, in fact, you could be spending £139,000 on lunch. And the way that this was worked out was that we took a hypothetical doctor who was spending £200 a month on lunch at the hospital. I think that boils down to be about seven or eight pounds a day. We reduced that to £1.50 a day over a 30-year career. That would save you £59,750 if you just saved that money. And then you're looking at the second line, the, 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 the field line, thinking what's going on there. That is if you invested that £59,750 you saved by not eating lunch at the hospital every day. That's what that would compound at 6% over 30 years. So what we're talking about here really is a really key concept, opportunity cost. So opportunity cost is a really important concept to explain, and I'm slightly nervous about explaining this in front of someone who's got a degree in economics, uh, Ed, so correct me if I'm wrong here. But essentially, the opportunity cost here is if you didn't spend that money on lunch, what could you have done with it instead? You could have just saved it in the bank and got £59,750, but as we'll get to later, if you had invested that money for 30 years over... 30 years at 6%, that would turn into £139,000. So that is how buying lunch at the hospital, the opportunity cost of that is absolutely massive. And that's just one example. Imagine if you could just trim a bit of expenditure elsewhere. And the reason why this is important, the reason why Warren Buffett says, do not save what is left after spending, instead spend what is left after saving, is that without this extra money, nothing's going to work. You're not going to be able to generate extra income to pay down bad debts and then once you've done that invest and i think that should lead us into paying down bad debts because that's important yeah absolutely and it's obviously everyone think when you when you think about saving money people often think about putting that money into a bank account which of course it is but 
also don't forget if you're paying down your debt as well that is effectively saving money yeah so that is also something really important to do and there are lots of people out there understandably who've got into debt who've got quite expensive credit cards and other bad debts so a bad debt would be a debt that's not backed against an asset with a, a high interest rate like credit cards or certain car loans etc so don't forget that saving money isn't just putting money into a bank account it's also and paying down or paying off those bad debts as well. It's something that's really important to do. Yeah. The way I think about paying down debt is that, as you said, paying down debt is an investment. If you've got a credit card with debt on it at 19%, okay, you should not be investing any spare money. You should be paying down that 19% debt. If you pay down a 19% debt, you're effectively generating a 19% guaranteed return. Yeah. No investment that I know of is going to generate you a guaranteed 19 percent return so it's painful paying down debt we've both done it ourselves we're going to talk about that in a bit later with our new year's resolutions but if you've got bad debt you really got to get rid of that and i think as you say bad debt credit cards and stuff student loans is really complicated broadly i would say that's more like a graduate tax not a bad debt and if you want to know more about student loans go to medicsmoney.co.uk forward slash w m s t u the new medical school student section, they've got an ebook where it explains student loans in detail, but they have changed. But just think about carefully about student loans because uh, they're really complicated. So mm. get those credit cards paid off. And then once you've done that and you've generated lovely spending habits, making a nice healthy lunch every day instead of eating rubbish food from hospital canteens, with all due respect to our colleagues who work hard in the canteens in difficult circumstances, then you could think about investing, okay? But wait, hold up. Before you start, oh, I should think about, can I show you my favorite slide? You're thinking I could save money or I could invest money. Okay. So over the long term, cash is not safe. It is not an investment. It feels safe because it's sat in your bank account. This is my favorite graph from Vanguard. It just shows you that over the long term, because of inflation, cash is not an investment. Okay. We've got four lines here. We've got a line in, in dark blue showing what would happen if you just put the 10,000 pounds in 1998 in the bank by 2022 you would have around 20,000 pounds okay great you'd have 20,000 pounds in the bank but adjusted for inflation in real terms which is the only return that matters right in returns after inflation are the only returns that matter in my opinion because that's what you're saying is you're going to convert that money into buying something good with the money and and therefore real returns are the only ones that matter in real terms 10,000 pounds in, in the bank in 1998 in 2022 would be worth way less than £10,000. And that is such a difficult concept to get your head around because we've been told cash is safe, put your money in the piggy bank. Over the long term, it's not what I do, it's not what you do. And the listeners will make their own mind up once they've seen this graph. And then the other the other line on that chart just shows if you invested in a FTSE All World, a low cost, globally diversified index tracker, super easy, low maintenance type of investment, over the long term, £10,000 into that in 1998, it's gone up, it's gone down. But overall, in 2022, it's worth just under £50,000. So cash is not safe in the long term. I don't regard cash as investment. Not advised to do your own research. Check out the graph on the screen. The other point is that I just wanted to say about, it looks like we're going to talk about, let's save that one for investing and let's go protection because you should need to think about this before. So we've got four questions about protection. Number one is, have you got savings set aside that would get you through a difficult three months? What we're talking about here is an emergency fund. We've done a whole podcast on this, but in brief, an emergency fund is three months of your outgoings, not your salary, your outgoings. Hopefully your salary and your outgoings are not the same. They <laughs> hope not. But you're on a budget now, so sure <laughs> with that bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, that will get you through three months. And that's just to protect you from any shocks. Unexpected things do happen. So if you haven't got an emergency fund, I would, in order, do my budget, get some spare money by budgeting, not buying lunch hospital, pay down my bad debt, and then I'll start to establish an emergency fund in that kind of order. I don't know what you think about that order of play. Yeah, no, I think that's really, it's really important. So yeah, get, get some, get, yeah, get that emergency fund sorted first off. Yeah, really important. Nice. And then next step, income protection insurance. Okay. You need to understand about income protection insurance. If you get ill and couldn't work, how would you pay your bills? Okay. You need to know about sick pay. The NHS sick pay is pretty generous. It increases over time. We've got an article on our website, which if you take the little survey, our financial scorecard, it will point you towards if you need it. But essentially your sick pay increases over time. 
six months full pay, six months half pay is the absolute maximum. But in your first year as a doctor, it's significantly less than that. And guess what? If you go abroad for a year to do a fellowship year or something, depending on the terms of your contract, your sick pay entitlement can reset. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine's consultant, been working in the NHS for about 15 years, 14 years, same amount as me, their sick pay entitlement when they left to go abroad was six months full, six months half. They come back and they're back down to, I think it's one month full and one month half, something like that. It's something awful, yeah. So think about that. You need to think about some insurance. There's loads of different ways to get insurance. All you need to know is you need to speak to an independent, not a restricted financial advisor who understands doctors. The medical marketplace is dominated by restricted advisors. Restricted advisors can only sell you a restricted range of policies and therefore you might not get the best deal. For some reason, medical schools, some more colleges love to promote these restricted advisors. I have no idea why they do that. Perhaps there's a financial incentive for them to do so. We passionately believe in the value of independent financial advisor. An independent financial advisor will search the whole market for you, unlike a restricted advisor, to make sure that you get the best deals. Have a look at that on the website. Next thing, life insurance. And is this a good time to... Oh, no, the next one's your will. Spoiler. Life insurance, again, you need to have a think about this if you die. Now, people say the NHS pension's got death and service benefits, and that's awesome. It's an absolutely awesome benefit, but it's broadly two times your pensionable pay. And it depends on your outgoings and stuff, but for me, two times my pensionable pay is nowhere near enough for my family to continue living the life that they live at the moment if I was to die. And if two times your pensionable pay is enough, you have got a massive NHS income, which fair enough, someone's yeah, got, yeah, someone must be earning it though, <laughs> or your outgoings are really low, but just have a think about worst case scenario, because what we're trying to do here is build a plan that's really robust so that your financial goals and objectives get delivered without anything derailing them. Mm. And things do happen to derail them as regular listeners and viewers will know about my situation. But because I've got all this in place, it hasn't derailed my finances at all. And I could just focus 100% mm. on rehabilitation. Final point, and I think this is going to be your New Year's resolution, is wills. So yeah. tell us why we need a will. Yeah, but I've got. By the way, I've got two years of resolutions, but this is this is one of them. And uh, yeah, absolutely. As you may have guessed, from what just why I'm talking about this, I don't have a will, and so it's definitely something I really want to get working on ASAP to get in place. Because if you don't have a will, wills are basically. I'm sure obviously you know this, but uh, a will is a legal document that will explain how your assets are shared out, divided once you pass away. Now, if you pass away without a will then the special rules apply, really ancient old rules called the rules of interstice. And they basically there's basically a long list of where your where your assets go. So you start with point one, if you're if you're if you're married with no children, then all your money will all your all your estate will go straight to your your part your wife, civil partner, or husband, etc. And then it works down the list basically as to where the money goes. Now that's that may potentially be okay for you for you, but mo for most people they would actually want more say as to where their assets go. And unless you make a will, you, you basically, you're at the mercy of these, these old ancient common law rules. So without a will, you can't dictate where your assets go. Okay. Now, if I passed away, I don't, I'm not married. I don't have kids. If I died, all my money would go to my parents. Not the worst thing in the world. They can then give it to people all I want. But to be honest, my parents are, are old and I don't think they'd really want the, the hassle or the stress of they're not to, listening, mate. We're about to find out if they listen to the pod. I, I, I suspect that they don't. I don't my mum knows what a podcast is. <laughs> or my dad, in fairness. Yeah, so at the moment, all my money would go to them. But actually, it went to my, my nieces and nephews. So that's one thing that I'm going to do this year, is try and get that in place. Awesome, mate. Okay, you've done all that. You've got your protection sorted. You've paid off your high interest rate debt. You've got an emergency fund, protection. You might be thinking about investing. Okay, and you might still be reeling from that first graph that I showed you where £10,000 of cash saved in the bank actually lost value thanks to inflation. You're probably not going to enjoy this next graph because this next graph shows you three doctors who all invest £200 a month. Okay, and it's titled, You Can't Save Your Way to Wealth. If you're watching on YouTube, you can read the graph yourself. But if you're on the pod, we've got Dr. Consistent who invests £200 a month every month from the age of 25 until 65 and an average of 6% return, which after inflation 
Inflation adjusted is a very reasonable and historically realistic return if you were to invest in a globally diversified index fund, sit back and do nothing. That's all you got to do. That would get Dr. Consistent £381,604. And she has only contributed £96,000 there. Nice. It compounds. My point about this graph is compound interest, yeah. eighth wonder of the world. You need to start investing as soon as possible. I really wish I'd started investing earlier, but I was paying down hideous debts and did medicine as a second degree. I was basically not, I didn't have any money to invest at all. But if you've got, got some spare cash, just start investing because the next line that we're going to look at is Dr. Late. Okay. So Dr. Late only started investing age 40. Again, 200 pounds a month from age 40 to 65. So they invested £60,000 and they turned that into £135,282, okay? Not by leaving it in cash, but by investing it, okay? So not bad, but that late penalty is pretty pretty harsh there. And then Dr. Nervous, who didn't listen to Medics Money podcast, thought that cash was safe, thought that cash was an investment. So they started saving £200 a month from age 25 to 65. And that... They invested £96,000 and that only turned into £98,000. Do your own research. Investing is not for everyone, but in our opinion, over the long term, cash is not great. And, and at the moment, interest rates is just high and everyone's like, oh, should I go back to cash? Look at this graph. Over many, many, many years, stocks have massively outperformed cash. And throughout that time, we had super high interest rates in the 1970s. And still, over the long term, stocks and shares outperform. And the reason why is of something called the equity risk premium. So if you're going to invest, you are taking a risk. And in order to take that risk, you need to see a reward over and above what's called fixed return assets, which we could call cash for simplicity's sake. I know the students of investing, that's an oversimplification. If you're going to invest, you need extra, you need extra return. The equity risk premium is the extra return that you get over time. And over time, over the last 100 years, this is, it does vary, of course, but it's been between about 4 to 5% that stocks and shares outperform cash, which makes sense, really, because if you're like, OK, you could keep your money in the bank or you could invest it, which is riskier, but not as risky as maybe it's made out to be. You're going to want to get an extra bit of bonus for that. The equity risk premium is the bonus. So have a look at that. But. I just think you need to start thinking about this. And, it's, and also, the other thing I would say is that when I started investing, I was investing tiny amounts and it seemed absolutely pointless. Why did it seem absolutely pointless? So it's just another way to demonstrate compound interest. Same graph, but along the axis, I've marked the time that it took Dr. Consistent, who, remember, got to £380,000, to get to their first 100K, their second 100K, and their third 100K. So this is just a nice visual demonstration of why the first 100k is, in my opinion, the hardest. Because it took Doctors Consistent 21 years of investing to get to her first 100k, right? Painful, feels pointless. But then it took her only 10 years to get the second 100k. Okay, not bad. And it took her only third, it took her only six years to get the third 100k. The, the slope of that compound graph builds up rapidly over time. But First 100K, 21 years, painful, seems pointless. Second 100K, 10 years, feels better. Third 100K, six years, no worries. The eyeball in the graph, the fourth 100K looks to be three or four years, roughly. You know, if you have started, it is a long game. It is a long-term game. There's no get-rich-quick schemes, but you need to think about keeping all your money in cash. Not advice, but have a think about it. And if you think investing is really complex, and that is one of the questions, uh, do you worry that investing is too risky or complex? You absolutely need to know what you're doing. But the good news is investing is a lot easier than doing being a doctor. I genuinely, my investments are on autopilot. The direct debit comes out every month. And as I review them once a year, I hardly make ever make any changes. My strategy has been set 13 years ago, haven't changed it, and it's going all right. Uh, or to another quote from Warren Buffett, in investing, it is not necessary to do extraordinary things to get extraordinary results. Investing is basically a test of character, not intellect. It's basically, can you set your investments up and sit back and ignore the noise, ignore people saying there's a crash, you've got to sell, and just keep investing every month. Keep not buying lunch at the hospital. Keep channeling that into your stocks and shares, ISA. Take advice if you need it. 
You can also do it yourself. We've got tons of resources on here for YouTube on our YouTube channel. If you are thinking about investing yourself, it's not difficult, but you do need to start and don't be doctor nervous and don't be doctor late on that graph. Anything to say about investing, mate? I, I, I just want to say that I definitely agree. It's not, I think a lot of people get that kind of mental barrier that it's going to be like really difficult to do, really complicated to, to set up. And actually, it really isn't particularly complicated to, to sort out. I'd say I'm, I'm because I originally had a different career and then went into medical school and put myself for pay, paid to get through that. I, I was a little bit of a late investor. But you so have started. I have started. Yeah, I started as soon as I could. And yeah, I've not found it complicated at all to, to do. Yeah, it's not complicated. If that's what's putting you off investing, don't worry, it's not particularly complicated. There is there is always going to be a little bit of risk involved you know, if you're investing in stocks and shares. But as Tommy said, over the long term, yeah, you know, it's it's a good good return usually. Yeah, and just you know, sit back, do nothing, ignore the noise. The financial press needs sensationalist headlines to sell newspapers. Like you're not going to sell many newspapers if you say buy a globally diversified, low cost index tracker and wait thirty years for every day on the front page. Not front page news, is it? Mm. It's much better to be sensationalist. Stock market crash, equities meltdown. Ignore that. If you've got the right strategy at the, at the start, and this could be where a financial advisor could help you, then it's a game of patience, a game of time. It's a test of character, not intellect. And I think for doctors, this can be really hard to understand because it's like work really hard at school, get rewarded. Train yeah. really hard at sport, get rewarded. Work really hard at investing, trade all the time, analyze the financial times, look at all the latest stock prices and sell and buy. You don't get rewarded. You, you actually yeah. lose. The majority of people that trade actively in the manner that I've just described lose money. Meanwhile, a whole load of people sat there in an index fund that matches their risk tolerances and their preferences and they've taken proper advice or know what they're doing are just slowly compounding their way to wealth. Do the thing, do the, do the scorecard. We link to our best investing content there. Hopefully that helps. I think that's balanced. Yeah, I think so. There's one last investing question if you want to cover that as well that people will see in the scorecard which is about investing in rental property ah. which is another option for people you can invest in, in rental property again we're not giving any recommendations about what you should or shouldn't do with your investments but it's something that people would want to consider it's seen as relatively the risk is is seen as as is okay because you know in general house prices do rise over time but of course it's incredibly illiquid if you do invest in a rental property it's very difficult to get that money back if you do and by the way we're talking about investing in rental property that's not your own home so your own home that's that's a very important asset but a lot of people will go and buy a second property or a third property or whatever and and rent it out as i say the rewards technically are generally seem to be very good in the sense that the housing market in in general goes up over time but of course yeah that money is very very liquid and also just one thing to say about that just to be balanced is over time the general environment in the polit political world is getting making it more complicated to invest in rental properties because a higher council tax now for second properties there's higher stamp duty for second properties but if you've got the money it's definitely worth worth looking into having a having a property empire as i would say is, would be a phenomenal thing to have yeah, we've got some really, I love our YouTube comments section because some channels, the YouTube comments are absolute trash, but on ours, it's just really polite and really good points. So me and Ed are on record as we prefer stocks and shares and we've outlined why. Lots of doctors prefer property and we get that. Someone just made a really, really nice point about this the other day. And I think we are balanced. But I have a property investment. You, you, you don't, but we prefer stocks and shares because it's on autopilot. Like literally my stocks and shares are on autopilot, but I guess it just depends what you know. Mm. So stocks and shares has worked really well for us. Properties worked all right for me, but I just love stocks and shares because it's on autopilot. It's low maintenance and I can focus on being a doctor. I'm not getting like people, my, my tenants calling me up and like middle of a war round being like, can you fix the boiler? And I know you can get people to manage it for you and stuff. I was briefly a landlord. And I do own a small property investment now, but I prefer stocks and shares. But thank you for the balanced feedback because I know lots of doctors love property and have done remarkably well in property. But for us, just maxing out that stocks yeah. and shares, I is boom. Yeah. Also, you need far less money to invest into stocks and shares than you would do for property. So if you haven't got the cash to do property, that's something to think about. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Um, love it.
Awesome. And if you are on YouTube, hit us up in the comments. We answer all the questions that we can. There is a bit of a comment backlog because some of them are really complex pension questions, but we're doing a whole episode to mm. sweep up all the pension questions. But other things, we can do it. Okay, cool. And then the final category in the uh, scorecard is tax. I hand the ceremonial microphone over to our resident tax expert, Dr. Ed Cantello, Chartered Accountant, Chartered Tax Advisor. There we go. So yeah, so there, there are basically three tax questions in the um, financial early warning score. The first one is, are you confident about what tax allowances and reliefs you should use to reduce your tax bills? There are a number of things out there that you can do to minimize your tax liabilities. And don't forget there are multiple taxes. So people think about income tax, but of course there are other taxes out there that, that affect people, capital gains tax, inheritance tax, etc cetera, etc cetera. okay knowing about what exemptions there are which what what is exempt from the various different taxes is, is really useful to know okay so for example there's a, a dividend allowance on top of your personal allowance which is tax-free so you've got uh, a dividend allowance at the moment of a thousand pounds next year it's going down to 500 pounds but that's quite important to utilize if you can if you do have to or do want to sell some assets can you get to a point where you can sell them in such a way that you, you utilize the annual exempt amount for capital gains tax. And we've got a whole inheritance tax podcast, number 175, which goes through the various ways that you can st structure your estate to minimize your inheritance tax liability. So we always say that if you don't know, you don't know what you don't know, but if you don't know about these taxes and what you can do, you're going to run into paying more tax than you should do. Okay, check out, I hope, so the, the scorecard should uh, lead you to areas where you can go to, to learn all about these things. Make sure you know about the release that you're entitled to. Mate, the scorecard will lead you to the most important areas for you, which is why yep. you like it. And if you've done the scorecard, like we're just testing this out. If you like it, can you let us know in the comments and also give us some suggestions because we've tested it out on 80 people who are in our inner circle email group. Totally, totally free to join our We've got fifth, nearly 50,000 email subscribers. There's an inner circle. All you've got to do is join the inner circle is tell 10 of your friends about our email. And you get in the inner circle and you get to test things before they're released. So, but give us some feedback because that would really, really help. I think like the one thing for me with tax is that you need to start viewing tax as a negotiation, right? And by that, I mean, if you sit back and do nothing about this, the HMRC won't phone you up and say, oh, hi, Dr. Perkins, I see you've taken a super expensive exam. Do you know that you could claim up to 40% of the cost of that back? They're not going to do that. They're not going to do it for you. you got to do it yourself. And we've got all the resources you need on our website to hopefully do that yourself, which kind of leads you in to the next question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the next question is, do you claim tax rebates on GMC, Royal College and exam fees? And this is really, really, really important because we pay a lot of um, professional expenses, just like we just said, the GMC fee, the Royal Colleges, but also other things, indemnity insurance, um, you may want to, you may pay for the BMA, etc. So there are quite a few professional expenses that we incur as healthcare professionals, and you can get the tax back on all of those things. So if you're not already claiming a tax rebate on them, and it, and it includes the Royal Colleges um, expensive exams as well, and any resits that you may sadly have to do, if you do have to do, do resits, you can claim the tax back on those, which could be in theory up to 60% of the tax back. More likely it's going to be about 40%, don't get me wrong. Uh, and if you haven't done already claimed, it's definitely, definitely worth uh, worth claiming that, okay? You'll be guided to, you'll be led to this. We have got a free guide that step-by-step -step takes you all the way through how to make that tax rebate. And of course, if you, if you save that money, if you get the tax back, you can then invest it and, and then compound it as well. So well worth doing. Awesome, mate. We'll do our New Year's resolutions in a minute. The reason why I've just remembered about my news resolutions is because of this next question, which yeah. if you're answering no to this, me too. But Ed, tell us about this. Yeah. So the next question or well, last question in the tax part is, are you using government incentives to maximize tax efficiency, basically? Because there are certain things that you can do when you invest um, that is that will be very tax efficient. Now, the classic one really is is using ISAs. ISAs are basically tax-free wrappers for your either cash or your investments in stocks and shares that will allow you to get um, all the income tax-free. So any dividends or interest from the ISAs, that's tax-free. And any capital gain that you make when you finally sell those assets, if you have stocks and shares, they're also tax-free as well. So we are really all over uh, or we're really big on ISAs, basically. We think they're, they're, they're really good. That, that's not, we obviously try not to give 
financial advice because we're not meant to give financial advice but it's not particularly financial advice to say that ISAs are, are good things not paying tax and your interest dividends capital gains that is a good thing so if you're going to when you want to invest we would definitely recommend utilizing that tax-free ISA wrapper by the way there are also don't forget there are different types of ISAs as well there are junior ISAs there are cash ISAs there are stocks and share ISAs there's also the the lifetime ISA as well which we've talked about quite a lot but just to say if you listen to this and you haven't heard us talk about license before a LISA is a lifetime ISA you can set up before the age of 40 so make sure you do it before the age of 40 and basically up to a maximum of four thousand pounds can be invested each tax year and the government will top it up by 25 percent so if you were able to put in say four thousand pounds into your LISA the government would would give you one thousand pounds or 25 percent into that LISA so it's a very we we we, we love ISAs we think they're really, really good they have to be used for certain certain things. So you can only use it for either buying your first house up to the value of £450,000 or on retirement after the age of 60. So you can keep putting money in all the way up to the age of 50 and then take it out from the age of 60 when you when you want to retire. Now, LISAs, ISAs, they are usually on the whole, very, they're definitely tax efficient uh, and they are on the whole very good when it comes to risk. Obviously, stocks and shares, ISAs, you are exposing yourself to some risk. But as Tommy's pointed out, over time, generally, the stock markets do go up. They may go down as well as going up, but on the whole, they are a good thing. Now, there are other tax-efficient investments out there as well. One, which I just want to mention, people have their own views on them, uh, would be premium bonds. So you can invest in, you, in premium bonds. You can buy up to 50,000 of them. It's essentially, it's apparently got a guaranteed rate of return but realistically, it's a lottery, okay? Now, the prizes, every every month they do a prize draw, any prizes that come out of that that you, that you get, if you win, they're all tax-free. So it is, it is tax efficient, but you are basically at the whims of, of, of the, your luck, basically, as to whether you actually get anything out of using the premium bonds. But they are tax efficient and you can cash them in whenever you want really quickly. So some people do like them. We, we talked about this in, I forget what podcast, I think it might be on YouTube actually, about 10 places to store your cash. We store, or I store my emergency fund, I think you do as well, in premium bonds. So I do not regard premium bonds as an investment. Shoot me down in the comments or Ed's going to shoot me down by the look that he's giving me. Mm-hmm. But I use it to store my emergency fund because my emergency fund is there if I need it in an emergency, if I have an unexpected shock. So I need it to be liquid. That means it can't be in property. It can't really be in a stocks and shares ISA because if I have to draw it down at a time when the market is down, and remember the market goes up about 75% of the time, if it's on the down 25% of the time, then I draw it down, I'm going to make a loss. So I don't want to touch that. So it's like I need to store my cash somewhere where inflation isn't destroying it. We gave you 10 different places to do that in that YouTube video. And we do it in a few different ways, but some of mine's in premium bonds because, yeah, but my returns have been absolutely dire. Yeah, my, my returns haven't been particularly great either. But some people do like them, as, as Tommy said, they're, they're incredibly liquid. There is a chance, in theory, of winning a, a million pounds. I think there are two, two prizes of one million pounds every month. But hey, I think the risk, uh, the, sorry, they. The chances of getting that are astronomical, I think. So I've turned off my notifications, but my wife has got some premium bonds as well. And every month she's, I've won, I've won. And it's a bit of a teaser. It's like, you've won on the premium bonds. <laughs> log in to find out. She's, I'm going to log in. I'm going to log in. It's, oh, 25 pounds again. Oh, 25 50 pounds. pounds. <laughs> yeah, I think I got 100 pounds once. Uh, turned yeah. off those notifications, mate. Fair yeah. enough. Um, there are also some other schemes out there that are that are tax efficient. Okay. They're what, what are called the tax reducer schemes. They're called that because the way they work is you put an investment into certain schemes, which I'll come on to in a second, and you can basically deduct a proportion of that investment from your tax bill. You can reduce your tax bill by that amount. So those schemes are called the Enterprise Investment Scheme, uh, the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, uh, and also the Venture Capital Trust Scheme. And the way they work is you invest, um, you subscribe for shares in a very small companies, and then once you get those so shares, as I say, you can then claim the tax, some tax back. For example, if you invest in the EIS scheme or the VCT scheme, you can claim back 30% or you reduce the tax bill by 30% of the amount you subscribe for. So if you subscribe for £10,000 worth of shares in an EIS scheme or a VCT scheme, you can then deduct from your tax liability £3,000. That is pretty nice. And for the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, or SEIS, 
you can deduct 50%. So if I put £10,000 into an SEIS scheme, I could knock £5,000 off my tax bill. So it is very good. Other little perks are if you hold them for a certain amount of time, there's no capital gains tax when you sell them. There's usually no inheritance tax on them either. And for VCTs, then a, basically dividends are tax-free as well, up to a certain amount. But the, the amount is so high that for most people, it'd be all the dividend, dividends from them. The downside of them, because they do sound pretty good. Yeah, what's the catch, man? Yeah, the real Here comes the catch. Is, the catch. Yeah, they are incredibly, incredibly risky investments because by their nature, the only companies that qualify are companies that are very small kind of startup companies that there's no, they're not quite so experimental, but the new ideas, companies with new ideas basically out there. And the chances of you, of them going bust and you losing all your money are incredibly high. So, you know, they are, they are a good, good thing in some ways in terms of tax, but obviously don't let the, don't let the tax tail wag the dog there because the investments are incredibly risky. If you, if you've got the money, if you've got money to, to spare and you're interested, they are worth looking into, but yeah. Just bear in mind that you know, they're very tax efficient. They are very, very risky. There's something to think about. Yeah. I just want to wrap up and then I want to go through our resolutions from last year because we did this last year in public, accountability, and then we're going to set a new resolution. And yeah. So the last section of questions was just about how you organize your finances. And you might be like thinking, oh, this is pretty boring. OK, but this is really important. If you don't have a system to keep your financial records in place so that you want to aim to get this thing on autopilot. Honestly, I spend hardly any time managing my finances because the whole thing is on autopilot. If I buy something, I know what I can claim tax back on. I take a snap of it and I keep the receipt. And then when it comes to self-assessment time, boom, in it goes. Okay, my investments are on autopilot. I've got a will. All my protection is fully sorted, thankfully. Not the hand's looking not too bad today. It's a bit blue because I've just been in my garage, but... Yeah. But the questions were, do you feel worried about your financial position relative to your age? And at one stage, for me personally, my answer to this was 100% yes, because most of my friends left school at 16. I went to university twice. One of those was medical school. And so by the time I finished university, I was way in debt. I was earning hardly any money. And most of them had a three bedroom house or something. My mates from, from school. And I was just in a blind panic. And that's how I started getting interested in finances and ultimately how we get led here. So if you do feel worried about your financial position relative to your age, I've been there. I know you're nodding as well, mate, because you felt this as well. You say you, you funded your way through medical school. Yeah. 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 To go all my, all my savings. Because I didn't want, I, I lived in quite, yeah, I, I didn't want to move my, my flat. I was in, I lived in London. I was renting, but I didn't want to move. So I just paid expensive rent to stay there but yeah completely caned all my all my savings so you live like the pwc highly paid chartered tax advisor lifestyle but as a student is that what you're saying to us yeah basically and, <laughs> and, and lost all my savings but, had a good know, time though uh, yeah I, I you know i don't regret that bit because i quite enjoy living in london i live in brixton it's nice. <laughs> awesome mate yeah. but yeah if that is you don't panic right but do act you've got to start doing it and hopefully this scorecard and this podcast or YouTube is going to help you act. Final question, do you keep your financial records filed away in a well-organized way? This is absolutely mandatory. We've been through this so many times, but you need to keep your pay slips. You need to keep your pension documents, okay? So if you fill in the scorecard and you say no to this, we'll send you a nice little summary of everything that you need to think about getting from a financial records point of view. Okay, should we talk about the New Year's resolutions we set last year? how they've gone and then set new you've already set one new one for this year yeah. um which was to get a will so public accountability this time next year if you haven't got a will the podcast listeners are gonna be very disappointed in you <laughs> yeah that's true i do i do a second one as well do i sell that one now or uh... let's go to what you what was your resolution for last year i think i don't think it was to, to pay off my my help to buy a loan that's that was a big thing for me yeah a lot of people will be in this boat as well i'm sure but yeah because i i used up all my savings to go through medical school i didn't really have much of a deposit for a house even despite borrowing money of uh, various people i took out a help to buy a loan and that was due to be repaid for those of you who don't know what the help to buy loan is the help to buy loan scheme sadly is uh, ended now. i thought it was quite a good scheme anyway it's ended now but anyway for those of you who are lucky enough to get in there, it, they, basically the government would lend you 20, up to 20% of your house price. And then after the, for the first five years, there's no, no interest on that. But then from, from five years, they start to charge your interest, which, which goes up each year to reflect inflation. So I, I started to repay it in August. And my plan was to, to pay off my help to buy a loan this year. 
haven't done that, but not for one to try. And my main issue is, and I'm sure there are people out there who are in the same boat, is actually just trying to get help to buy to actually, you know, get off their, their backsides and do something. And, and also my lawyers as well. My, I, I had to engage a conveyance solicitor and like literally nothing's happened. So I got my house valued in June, paid all the admin fees, engaged a sister and, and nothing, literally nothing has happened. And I keep chasing everyone and nothing has happened. So that is still, that's a work in progress. I definitely got the ball rolling, but it's, yeah, still rolling. Mate, that is awesome. Yeah, you, you've basically done it. You've saved hard. You've got a budget. You've spent less than you earn. I'm not going to, I'm not, you're not going to pretend that you haven't bought coffee out and about, right? Because oh, no. that would be unrealistic for you. But the point is you've got that, you've saved hard and you've done it. So paying off debt, honestly, I love it. It feels really demoralizing at the time. But when you've, when you're debt free, having been in tons of debt, it feels amazing. Trust me. So I'm, I'm, I know you haven't technically done it, but I'm going to say that you've achieved that. Yeah, I'm definitely trying. It's not, it's not because of me that it hasn't happened. Yeah, so. fair. Last year, my New Year's resolution, which I actually started before New Year's, was to get fit because I like surfing, kite surfing and riding my bike. And I just always relied on doing the activity to stay fit. And then uh, related to getting over 40, I just started to get a bit slower, feel a bit more achy. I couldn't go surfing for five hours uh, every day and then next day my arms were just stuck in the paddle position like that what's wrong with you i was like oh, i've been surfing so i decided to get fitter and i worked really hard at this and it was going amazingly well and i went on a surf trip in the end of march and i was surfing the best i ever had just because i think it's more like flexibility i've been doing like a lot of yoga and stretching i know it sounds a bit strange but the flexibility was amazing i just couldn't miss waves and i was just surfing amazing and it was going really, really well. And then as you may know, at the end of April, I chopped my index finger, thumb, and middle finger clean off, which set my fitness back a little bit. Yeah. So gonna help. I'm gonna say that I achieved it, but this year, my resolution is to get back fit because last year might've been a bit of a cop-out. It was pretty easy. The reason I didn't have a financial resolution last year is because my finances are pretty sorted. That's how it is. So I, I try to focus more on my health, but this year, my game is goal is to get back surfing, cycling, and the other things that I did with the hand, which is going amazing. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. Fingers moving, middle fingers just a work in progress. Thank you so much to everyone who helped me with that. But yeah, if my if it's okay, it's not a cop out. My resolution is to try to get back to the level that I was at. And I think I will. I've got this awesome break. So I can't break with my left hand on my bike which is a bit of a problem. Okay, yeah. I've got this amazing brake, which has two levers in one hand. It's called a Hope Duo. And mm -hmm. so my right hand does the braking. My left hand just has to hang on, which it can do. It just can't multitask. It can hang on, but not brake. Yeah. Yeah. So good. that's my goal. Yeah. But I'm aware that's a cop out. And going back to the scorecard, it's out of 16. I scored 15 out of 16 because I do not use government incentives to like the SEISs and stuff and the VCTs. So... I might do that. Yeah. Thing is, yeah. I've never changed my investment strategy and I hate risky investments. I just like boring things like that. I know that I can't pick stocks. Like I, I'm not a stockbroker, so yeah. I know that I can't do that. And I hate risky investments. I just like boring, stable investments, which I've done for many, many years and over many, many years, I've done really, really well with. But I feel like it's time to branch out a little bit. So I'm going to probably the core. I like to use like a core and satellite approach. So the core of my investing will always be stocks and shares ISA, <clears throat> property off the side, other business interests off the side, shall we say, other investments. And one of those little satellites of around the core, which is always going to be my stocks and shares ISA. I think I'm going to do some SCIS. Maybe we should do a pod on that, mate, where you can take me through it and pros and cons in a non-advised way. Yeah, we did. We did one on tax producers before, but a long, long time ago, I don't know, like 30 or 40 or something like that. So it's, it's a long since gone. Um, yeah. Happy to update people on that one. Uh, yeah. Not, we, we do get people asking about it. So yeah, let's do a podcast on that sometime soon. Okay, cool. So yeah, that's me. One, number one, get fit again, which is definitely more challenging than it was last year, but yeah. I've got a trip booked in October. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Who, who, who knows? I'm just grateful for how far I've got, but in my dreams, I'll be back surfing in october and if i am i'm going to tick this resolution off as done yeah and good. second one yeah maybe i'll start doing the seis you'll find out next year 
Yeah, I mean, definitely something to something to, to look into and think about and see what's cool. What What's your second resolution? Oh yeah, so yeah, I may or may not do this, but it would be good if I could. You've got it. If you I'll, announce it here, uh, you've well, got to do I'll, it. I'll announce. I'm going to look into it. I'm not going to announce. I'll do it. Because In the comments, because, what do we think about this? I even can do it, but I've got. So a lot of you guys will know that I do have uh, a LISA, as you'd expect, but I did set mine up quite last minute. It got to the day before I turned forty, and I realised I hadn't. I hadn't set one up. So I set one up the day before. Now, the only ones I could set up on that day, given I had less than 24 hours, was a cash LISA. So I would much, much rather it was in a stocks and shares LISA. So I guess the resolution would be to look into whether I can actually transfer that from a from a cash one into a stocks and shares one. The, the people that I use, I don't think they do a separate stocks and shares I said, I've got the cash one. Me. And if they had a one, I would move it into that. We'll do it right now. But it won't right we'll, we'll log off in a minute and we'll just oh, sort it Yeah, that's fair enough. I'll have, yeah, we'll, good, good to have a look. So it's cool. Yeah, they're called Beehive. I don't think they do a Stocks and Shares one. So it's whether I can move that into a different person's license. And your point is a good one, right? Because there are a li- there's loads of places you can have your Stocks and Shares ISA, literally loads, and they've all got their pros and cons. But there's actually very few that do a Stocks and Shares lifetime ISA. But I know a good place to do one. Fees are really, really low. Fees in investing really matter. You can buy a wide range of investments in there, should you so choose. Uh, and I think it just links back to one, one of our first points that you're going to hold that money until 60. Yep. So if you hold it for 20 years in cash, the, the, if it, history repeats itself, historically, that would have been destroyed by inflation if you just keep it in cash. Slide it into a stocks and shares ISA, keep contributing every year, sit back, age 60, party time. <laughs> That's it. Sports car. Yeah, that would be good. That would be good. But uh, yeah, party time does sound good when you, if I'm at 60 and able to party. We'll see. Nice one. Right. Thanks so much for yeah. watching and listening. Remember, if you want to access that scorecard, go to our website, justmedicsmoney.co.uk. It's on the homepage. Scroll down. There's a little kind of uh, siren signal. Fill it in. Now, we have only a 1,000 licenses because we're just testing this out, and there's about 50,000 people on our email list. So if it's not working when you get there, you should have subscribed to the YouTube channel, isn't it, really? Got there sooner. Yeah, that's it. I'm not like that. You definitely please subscribe. Yeah, but if, if people like it and the feedback's good, we'll buy some more licenses, but we only bought a thousand licenses at the moment because I want to test it out. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe. See you on the next episode. Yeah, thanks, guys. Cheers, bye.